We're rediscovering the grace of God in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians. Uh, we've already discovered there's an unusual intensity from Paul in the letter to the four Galatian churches because he's convinced that their spiritual freedom was at stake. Some false teachers were trying to convince them that the do-it-yourself religious model was the way to go. That the spiritual equation, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, didn't quite add up for them. I read on Tuesday morning a tweet that Pastor Tim Keller sent out. I thought it was so germane to our conversation. This is what he tweeted out. There are only two ways to read the Bible. Is it basically about me or is it about Jesus? And is the question, what must I do or is it what has he done? I have a very modest goal for this preaching series. A Copernican revolution in the life of our church. Like Copernicus who discovered that the earth revolved around the sun, not the other way around. I want us to become fully reoriented to the idea that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Faith in the Son, S-O-N, alone, and not by anything we ever do. And I think to be properly oriented, we're going to need a lot of help. So let's pause and ask for the Lord's help and His wisdom. So Lord, we do need Your help to understand Your Word and Your calling and where You're leading us. So we pray by your spirit, open our hearts this morning and speak to us through the medium of your word and keep transforming us by your word and by your spirit so we reflect your image more faithfully, more consistently, Lord, for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so our scripture reading this morning is from Galatians chapter 3. I'll be reading from verses 15 to 18. The section reaches all the way to verse, verse 25, but I'm going to focus this morning on Galatians 3, 15 to 18. Paul begins, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has already been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in His grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So Paul begins this section saying, essentially, how can I keep hammering home this point? How can I explain the life of faith in terms you're all familiar with? So he brilliantly calls their attention to the word for will and covenant because both terms come from the same Greek word. So let's start with a will. Once a will has been formally ratified and deposited at the municipal records office, no one can annul it 
or amend it in any way. And in Paul's day, we know that legal documents were actually sealed with a wax embossment. So they could not be in any way altered. They were considered irrevocable. But let's also consider the idea of covenant because it comes from the same word. This is the ceremony used in ancient times to create binding oaths between contractual partners. It sounds gruesome, I'll admit, and rather barbaric to our modern sensibilities. It was typically referred to as cutting a covenant because animals were sacrificed in the process and their parts were actually arranged in two rows upon the ground. The two parties involved in the covenant would then walk together between the animal parts while proclaiming their promises to one another. The covenant was considered sacred because blood had been shed and it was considered binding because three parties were involved. The two human parties plus God who was bearing witness to their oaths to one another. Their promises would also include some language to the effect of, with God as our witness, should we break these vows, may what happened to these animals happen to us. Now in this letter that we're reading to the Galatians, Paul repeatedly refers to the covenant made with Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15. This is when God promised to Abraham, well, rather this is when Abraham was declared righteous by God because of his faith and also God promised to bless him and his seed. Now the covenant promises made to Abraham were also offered to his descendants, all those who put their faith in God, that they too could be declared righteous before God. In verse 7, Paul had written, Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. So Paul tells the Galatians that those same promises have now been extended to all those who place their faith in Jesus Christ and the new covenant in his blood, both Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 29 says, Therefore, all who are in Christ are spiritual heirs of the promise made to Abraham. Now for our purposes this morning, it's really important for us to remember a very unique aspect of the covenant made with Abraham. This is from Genesis 15. I'm going to summarize it for you. While Abraham was sleeping, God alone passed through the pieces of the dead animals. And therefore, the covenant was sealed by God alone. In other words, nothing depended upon Abraham. Everything depended on God, who promised to be faithful to his covenant. Let's go back to Keller's questions. They are, is the question, what must I do? Or is the question, what has he done? Abraham received the promises by faith. 
and was declared righteous by God, not by fulfilling any conditions. Paul then reminds them in verse 17, once again, how important it is for them and for us to keep the chronology straight. The law and its commandments, he says, they don't show up for another 430 years. And when they finally do, he says, please don't think for a moment that this instituted a new way of becoming righteous before God. The promise to Abraham that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, was permanent and binding like a will or a covenant. And it didn't get supplanted or replaced by the law or the commands of God. He's essentially saying to them, this is where you're getting things all fouled up. You keep forgetting the chronology. The promise does not depend upon the law. And so I think Paul would say to us today, it all depends upon what Jesus did. The promise of salvation does not depend on anything you do. Like your spiritual forefather Abraham, just receive it by faith. In verse 19, Paul asks the $64,000 question for us. And that is, why in the world was the law given anyway? Why do we receive the commands anyway? Well, for several wonderful reasons that all reflect the love of God for us. We've talked about this at length. First of all, the law provided us with clear, loving guidance for our lives to keep pointing us in the direction that leads to life, that leads to an abundant, healthy life, and to keep warning us about those paths that don't lead to happy or healthy places. You know, I said this morning, quite frankly, at this point I've kind of run out of vocabulary and ways to say thanks to God for the gift of his word and all of his loving and thorough direction for my life. I mean, what a gift. It's my opinion that besides the gift of his son to us, it's the greatest gift he ever gave to us. The gift of his word. But the law was also given to us for another purpose. And that was to reveal our sin. Reminds me of an old story I read years ago from a pastor in Arkansas. This is what he writes. On a warm summer night, my wife and I were traveling in our car with Micah, our three-year-old son, who was sitting in the back seat. After many miles of driving in the darkness, we came to a stop in a remote area. And the brightness of the traffic light revealed all the dirt and all the dead bugs, all the insects plastered on our windshield. And Micah said, hey, look, look how dirty, Papa. My wife and I, the moment, didn't really think much of the comment. Till later when we drove on away from the light, back into the darkness, upon re-entering the darkness, we could no longer see the mess on our windshield. And Micah quickly piped up and said, hey, look, now the glass is clean. When God gave us the gift of his law, Torah, his word, the commandments, the light shined on the windshield of our hearts and revealed the filth of sin that we had collected on our journey. So the law then is a light 
that shows us just how sinful we are. Paul would write to the Romans later, through the law, we actually become conscious of our sin. Now it doesn't have the power to cleanse us or make us whole, but it certainly does have the power to show us our need for a Savior. So Paul concludes this section in verse 25 by saying this, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so let me finish with a story this morning. In the spring of 2006, I'd been serving here at NPC for about six months when I made a terrible rookie mistake. It was a Thursday morning in late May, and I decided that morning I would sequester myself so I could work on my sermon without any distractions. Well, that morning, instead of going to the library or another quiet place, I decided to work from home. And home at that time was the big white house on Neroten Avenue, Avenue where Jimmy and Andrea and Rory live now. Sometime around 11 o'clock in the morning, I glanced out the window and I noticed that people were filing out of the church. It was a lot of young families with young children. And I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if nursery school graduation was this morning. And then suddenly, I got this sick feeling in my stomach because it dawned on me. It was indeed the NPNS graduation. And I was the guest speaker. <laughs> so I scrambled to find my phone and when I did I discovered that there were about 20 voicemails left for me. Not a good sign. Marlene was scrambling to find me. I immediately called the church. I'll never forget how Claire answered the phone. She didn't say, Neroten Presbyterian Church, this is Claire, as she usually did. Instead, she said, yeah, you missed it. <laughs> Well, I felt, I just felt sick about it, honestly. I was so disappointed in myself. I let the nursery school down. I let the church down. At that point, I didn't feel like I'd been here long enough to earn enough trust to make this kind of blunder in so early in my tenure. I knew what I had to do, though. I need to apologize to our nursery school director, Kathy Viola. It was a long walk <laughs> down to the church. When I came to the doors at the end of the long hallway that led down to the education wing where the NPNS offices used to reside, I saw Kathy. And she was walking across the hall to the drinking fountain. So I walked up and I stood behind her. When she saw me, I will never forget it. She put her finger to her lips to indicate to me, don't say anything. And then she reached up, she planted a big kiss on my cheek, gave me a big smile and said to me, you are forgiven and you are dearly loved. I remember feeling the tears 
rolling down my cheeks because I had just experienced such profound grace. I just heard the gospel again. You know what I thought I deserved? I deserved a tongue lashing. Being read the riot act. Maybe a meeting with HR. <laughs> right? At least some form of demerit, shame, some kind of punishment. And I wanted to say, please, Kathy, let me do something to make up for this. Please let me earn back your love. Instead, I received a kiss. Kathy's been gone for a while now. But whenever I think of her, I am still moved in my heart by the power of her gracious life. Spiritually speaking, our whole life is a spirit series of terrible blunders, mistakes, and bad decisions. That's the human condition in sin. And that's why we live with such shame and guilt and frustration. When we finally come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The Lord gives us a big kiss. And he says, you're forgiven. And you are loved unconditionally forever. And we say, but what can we do to make up for it? And we can spend our whole life asking that question. And the answer is always the same. Nothing. Zero. Because Jesus took care of everything. And that's what Paul is straining to teach us this morning. Whenever we think of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, our hearts should be profoundly moved by the power of his gracious life. Moved by gratitude for his grace. We offer that same grace and forgiveness in all of our relationships. And by doing so, we communicate the gospel wherever we go. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.